Hi, I am Adam Ganser. I'm the executive director of New Yorkers for Parks, and we are thrilled to co-host this event with our great partners at Humanities New York. New Yorkers for Parks is the only independent citywide advocacy organization championing quality parks and open spaces for all New Yorkers and all neighborhoods. And Ann Button Weezer has played an instrumental role in our work, having served uh, for over three decades as a board member and as a past board chair. We are very honored to celebrate Ann and her new book, which is a quintessential story of parks activism in New York City. Our partners, Humanities New York, is the private 501c3 state partner of the National Endowment of the Humanities. And I'll turn it over now to Sarah Oger, the Executive Director of Humanities New York, to introduce our speakers. Sarah. Of course, I was on mute after all this. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, I want to thank you back. A big thank you to our co-hosts, New Yorkers for Parks, and also for some of the underwriters today who count among New Yorkers for Parks, big supporters and their leadership, Barbara Dixon, Adam Rose and Peter McQuillan, and Paul Gotzagan. We also thank Cornell University Press for their partnership on today's event. And then all I'm doing with us is introducing our speakers. Anne Lubin Buttonweiser is an urban planner and urban historian. She has taught at the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation at Columbia University. She is the author of, in addition to the floating pool lady, books titled Governor's Island and Manhattan Waterbound. Emily Rabiteau is an author and a scholar. Her books include a novel called The Professor's Daughter, and a work of creative nonfiction, Searching for Zion. Her fiction and essays have been widely published and anthologized in Best American Short Stories, The New York Times, The New Yorker, and elsewhere. She resides in New York City and teaches creative writing in Harlem at City College. So over to you, Emily. Thank you to start us off. Thanks so much. It's really an honor to have been invited to um, talk to Anne about her amazing book and this amazing project today. Um, so first off, I just want to say, and congratulations on the publication of your book, The Floating Pool Lady, A Quest to Bring a Public Pool to New York City's Waterfront. And it really um, is a quest that we were invited on in reading this book um, in which you pull off seemingly impossible, uh, kind of, it reminded me a little bit of Don Quixote, like, what, a, what an amazing, <laughs> charming idea to, to outfit a barge um, to become a pool for the sake of, uh, you know, New York City dwellers who might not get to um, swim otherwise. So I just wanted to, to begin by saying, fittingly, I, I finished your book this very hot weekend in New York City at, at a swimming pool while my eight and 10 year old sons were blissfully swimming. And last summer, because of the pandemic and closures, they didn't get to swim at all. Um, which was one of my biggest regrets as a mother um, during, during this crisis, because as you know, um, since this was your dogged dream for so long, it, there's nothing quite like the joy of a child in water, right? Like the liberating feeling of um, cooling off when it's hot and how hours can pass by with them just splashing, um, forgetting time almost, and you have to drag them out of the pool. Um, so maybe that, can I enter for one second because that reminds me of um, a visit I made to the pool when it a couple of weeks after it opened in Brooklyn and there was there were three or four mm, five to eight year olds that were sort of splashing around and they said to me why did you bring this pool here for free and how does that going to answer that how did you answer it well, I, I think I, I believe that I said, um, it's, I did it for you. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things I really deeply admired about this, reading this book and being introduced to your, your project um, is that it's, it's an act of love. And, and also when I think of racial justice and I wondered if we could talk, um, we'll get into it. We'll talk about, you know, how it was you became so fixated on this idea like the history of the floating pool and um how you how you how you became obsessed with um the notion to bring it back but i, I also wanted to just start by talking about um 
a little bit about the racial history of pools in America and who's gotten to swim and who hasn't and why you wanted to bring the you know swimming as a as a blissful and joyful activity to the people that um, might not have gotten to swim otherwise. Well, my background uh, research was in the bowels of the Battery Maritime Building, where they had boxes and shelves and drawers full of documents that were there had been there since the oh, 1880s. And I found something called the floating baths. And from that, I was able to put a history together of the, the prior floating pools. The baths were these um, open structures. They, they were lined with, uh, they had uh, wood on either side and on the bottom so people didn't fall out and swim into the, you know, get sucked into the river. And um, they were made by the, the, the progressives at the time were very interested in doing something to keep the, uh, oh, to provide a clean cleansing means for the people who lived in the tenements. And there was a tremendous amount of new tenement dwellers at that time. This was in, in the, well, that first one was in 1832, but that was a private one. So 1880, this was 1870, it took them oh, eight or nine or 10 years to convince the government to, in, in Albany to open these. And people were, came there, it was free, and they lined up and, and they were like 20 minutes each, each, each time, uh, you know, long, long lines. And they dipped in and theoretically became clean. The only trouble is that the waters were completely polluted because all of the sewers emptied into the river. Um, they, by the 1920s, the pools became a recreational place, mm -hmm. and uh, there were there were um, swim meets and games, and it, it was really very different from the from the cleansing time. And then in the 1930s, Robert Moses got money from the federal government to build his 11 in-ground pools. There's huge things that now exist. Um, Highbridge Pool in, in my neighborhood in Washington Heights, uh, one of those pools, I believe. Um, yes. This was a pool that, that was our regular pool before it, you know, it, it closed down because it couldn't be opened uh, last, last summer. Um, but it's such a, you know, a beautiful, uh, magnificent, actually two pools, um, Olympic-sized mm -hmm. pools, a wading pool and a swimming pool. Right. Um, you, you asked about, about who used them, yeah. and they were um, quite different groups. They were the, there were the Germans in one, there were the Irish in another, uh, there were the Italians in another, and I, I had a hard time finding uh, where the um, African Americans were, and they actually lived up in a neighborhood on the sort of middle west side in a community that was also an Irish community, and um, they, what happened was they ended up swimming there together, which was quite amazing because there were often fights between those two groups. And, mm -hmm. and then I found a wonderful story about a community uh, where uh, the whites um, teased the Italian kids and it was a very unpleasant experience. So it's um, when this pool opened, uh, what is so fabulous, particularly in um, Bar Barretto Point Park, there's a policeman stationed there every single day. This mm -hmm. policeman is also stationed at the local high school. All of the kids who come there know him and they know that they're not gonna misbehave and we've had no incidents. That's wonderful. And it's interesting to think about pools as um, sites of tension, even at Highbridge Pool, which I mentioned, um, we're discouraged from wearing certain colors that might be associated with this gang or that gang. Um, you know, it's very, in a way, kind of draconian entering in, in terms of what you can bring, right? Only a towel. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So th there's often, I think, like, paired with the, the, the bliss and the freedom of being in the water, this way that, you know, you're, you're also being sometimes, um, as, as a citizen, certain communities sort of surveilled to, to prevent violence or tension that might occur in that space. But um, I just wanted to say to the audience, because inevitably as Anne's talking about this uh, fascinating project and its history, you might have questions coming up. Feel free to use the, the Q&A function in the webinar 
we'll have time um, during the last 10 or 15 minutes of this hour to um, get to your questions, but you, you should go ahead and feel free to start entering them into the Q&A now. Um, and I, I really love the, the prologue of your book. <laughs> for, for those who haven't yet had the opportunity to read it, um, I wonder if you, if you mind maybe just to, like, not to have a, a spoiler, but distilling that, that little story of you falling off the yacht as a child. Um, and um, why, why you chose to open your book with that scene. I have, as a writer, I have some thoughts about why that's like the perfect way to start, but I wanted to hear from you. Um, I, I don't know why I started. I just thought I loved that story and I figured it was swimming and the whole book was about swimming and this was a good way to start it. But basically, for those who haven't read the book, um, I'm on a boat with my father and there were the whole, this, the, they were all government officials part in the Roosevelt administration. And they were smoking their cigars and they were drinking their rum and paying absolutely no attention to me. And I was totally bored. And I went to try to get up uh, on the deck to sort of get out of the way. And I fell overboard. The rest of it is for you to read. <laughs> I, I also love how you finish that section where I finished the prologue with um, like a line of encouragement that's in a, in a voice that made me automatically love you where you say something along the lines of like for, you know, for citizens out there who want to basically build a dream, you know, my advice to you is, is to fight like hell. Um, and then prior to the prologue, you have this list of acronyms at the beginning of the book, which is really long, <laughs> city and state agencies that you worked with to pull off this really unlikely dream of, of urban planning for the common good. I wonder if you could just talk about, um, you know, what were some of the challenges with having to work with so many agencies um, and perhaps what were some of the rewards? Well, I'd say um, among the challenges is, is we had to get permits in order to, to, to be there, both in Brooklyn and then also, well, by the time it opened in Beretta Point Park, I had donated the pool to the Parks Department, so they were in charge of everything. But we needed, um, one of the first permits we needed was proof of, in order to bring the boat from New Orleans, where it was being built, to uh, Brooklyn Bridge, to the piers there. This was prior to Brooklyn Bridge Park actually being built. It was, we decided to put it there because it might bring people to the waterfront and the Brooklyn people would understand that their neighborhood wasn't going to be totally ruined if there was a park there. And so the pool was sort of a, a draw. Anyway, for us to land, the state said, we needed a letter of, of proof that Neptune Foundation, which is a foundation that I created, had a car license. A car license for a boat? <laughs> anyway, it took them 24 hours for, we had to, you know, our attorney had to go and prove that in fact we didn't have a car and that we didn't need a car. Um, then there's another thing, uh, the jurisdictions, um, again, where, where we would have to get the permits, uh, if it, was it a boat? Well, then it would be in the Coast Guard jurisdiction. If it was a building, then it would be in the small building services. Was it the environment? Then it would be the State Department of Environmental and Conservation. They were in charge and they gave me the biggest problems. Uh, the barge was going to cast a shadow and kill fish. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of people you had to different agencies you had to work with. Um, can you tell us a little bit more also about the challenges of finding and outfitting a vessel? Um, oh, that was that was fun. That was fun. Uh, we were able to work with uh, Charles Cushing, who is the most amazing builder of boats, fancy boats, ships, all sorts of things, and he put this young man who just graduated from uh, maritime school in charge of doing this. So we decided we were going to get, I had a $250,000 budget for buying the, the barge. So we were gonna buy a used barge and um, we went out, He, the young man went out to look for that, except that the first time he went out, 
there were none available. They were all extremely, extremely expensive because there were very few available. And um, eventually uh, he did find one and it was um, a Panamanian owned boat that was in the, uh, in the boonies of, of Louisiana. And we purchased it, um, some of it in Spanish. And then we brought it to, uh, well, actually we, we, we sent out bids to various uh, shipyards and Bollinger was a shipyard in, in Metairie, Louisiana that said they would build it. And my favorite story about, about Bollinger was that, you know, when he took it on, he was really saying, well, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And um, I went to visit the barge when it was nearly finished. By, by, by the way, what we did is we, dug, we took part of the deck off that was enough to hold a half Olympic sized pool. And then we sort of actually kept the, the original bottom of the pool of the, of the deck and put that back in. That's the bottom of the pool. And so uh, I went to see the pool, you know, when it was nearly finished and went to a local dive where they were selling crayfish. They had just come into season. And Bollinger happened to be in this same restaurant. Or, and um, he came up to me and said, stopped everybody in the room and said, this is Ann Buttonweiser. She's the floating pool lady. I'm building her boat. <laughs> he was so, so proud of it. <laughs> As well, he should have been. I, I love that story. Um, so one reason why I really love your your advice to, you know, fight like hell for police. I, women, I have to give credit to yeah. a friend of mine who was actually one of the early reviewers of the book, of, of the idea of the book. And she said, you ought to publish it. She fought like hell. She did, yeah. Yeah, because I think it's an unlikely um, story, right? When this, when I was invited um, and to to be your interlocutor for this event, you know, and I, I thought, what what is this? It's it was so bizarre and so interesting to me. Um, but and then as I as I got into the book, just reading it as a you know literally as like a quest of doing something beautiful for the common good, um, overcoming the challenges in having to pull something like this off, um, even as there are people who understand its value, there are just, as you, as you share, there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of red tape, right? There's a lot of bureaucracy. Um, but I, I work for City College, as has been mentioned, which is part of the um, CUNY system. So I'm technically a city worker and I know, like, you know, when you, when you choose to work for one of these, these um, in the arena of the common good, often it can feel like uh, bureaucracy is floundering and inept, and that's and it's usually because of underfunding and understaffing, right? Um, I had a mentor early in my career tell me, you know, in this in this game, you got to ally yourself with individuals, not institutions, and that's how you keep from getting bitter when you hit roadblocks, right? You find the people who are good at their job, who are committed, who are not. Um, yet ex so exhausted that they've given up. Um, I, does that accord with you that, you know, to get things done, you ally yourself with individuals, not institutions? And if so, who are some of the other people who helped you to pull this off along the way? Um, yes, I agree with that. Um, fortunately, I, I worked in every city agency that had a waterfront portfolio. And um, for example, the Parks Department allied with Henry Stern at first, I said, I want to build a barge or swimming pool and bring it to New York, would you take it? And he said, yes, I will take it, but you have to run it. Then Henry retired and Adrian Benepe came and became in charge. And I went to Adrian and I said, actually, I have a barge now. If I bring it to New York, would you take it? And he said, yes, I will take it and I will run it. So mm -hmm. that's that was really important. I mean. As um, in fact, he did not have the run, the money to run it when when we brought it to New York. It was a year later that we then went to Barreto Point Park, which is under his auspices. But um, who else? Let's see. Well, for example, Jennifer Rimmer, who was 
uh, charged by the state to actually get the pool open in, in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bridge Park, what was going to be Brooklyn Bridge Park. And she was unbelievable. I mean, she basically just sat us down every week. We had a meeting, we had six weeks to go, we're gonna open it. And that's, there's no ifs or buts, and or buts about that. Mm -hmm. and, but she did come up to me one day and she said, Anne, there's an elephant in the room. Yes, well, it's the state DEC. They may not give us a permit. Oh no. And how did you, yeah, well. <laughs> and in the end, what happened was they did not want to give us a permit. They're, they have a very important role, basically. They don't want the rivers clogged with all of these floating things, a floating gas station, floating hotels, floating um, living, living quarters. So if they said yes to me, what was going to happen? All these other people are going to want to do it. Gotcha. So they had to prove that to the, or tell the other people, don't dare do it because we've just fined her $20,000. So, which means if you're gonna try to do it, you're in trouble. <laughs> Got you. So what- And guess what? I paid the $20,000. That was my next question. <laughs> yeah, I did. I mean, my board said to me, there were members, most of them, some said, I'm, I support you. And, and particularly one of them who was very important on the board, said, um, you know, I'm gonna resign if you pay it. But if I didn't pay it, the project was dead. Right. And the pool was there, the pool was done. Yeah. And I just had to take the chance. Yeah, at that point it would have been a tragedy and a travesty to give up, right? I mean, mm -hmm. um, what advice do you have for people maybe starting out their careers working for parks. I know there are a lot of parks people in the audience today or mm -hmm. other, other careers in the arena of a common good who, who have a lot of idealism but often come against roadblocks like this when they're trying to be innovative. Well, when again, when I graduated from um, graduate school, I wanted to work in a, um, a, a paying job that uh, was, was a consultant. So I went to talk with various people who had architectural consultancies, et cetera. And they all said to me, and I didn't wanna work for the city because I thought, oh, it's just gonna be bureaucratic and nobody can get anything done. And I went to speak with somebody whose name escapes me at the moment, Stan Ekstad, and who had been very important. Been, yeah, I think he was actually, at one point, he was on the uh, city planning commission. And, um, he said, work for the city. It will be the best way to learn uh, how to get things done. Mm -hmm. And he was absolutely right. I went to the parks department, Henry gave me a job. Obviously Henry knew me. So I was really, you know, I wasn't a stranger there and I wasn't exactly young at that time. And um, he let me do whatever I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, he gave me a job, I had to do a, a waterfront plan for the parks department, but in the meantime, he let me open uh, a place for um, rowing to go off into the water. There's whole, we, we did a floating bath, I'm uh, sorry, a floating um, cinema one, one year, mm -hmm. you know, again, crazy things. <laughs> yeah, I think the trick is often in finding the other innovative people, right? The people who are maybe as crazy as you are, who, <laughs> who would just say, Yes, <laughs> exactly. And holding exactly. on to those relationships yeah. and cultivating right. them. So take us back. At, you, you shared um, about you know learning about the history of these um, floating vessels back when they were for bathing, not for recreation. Um, so so you know some people might, I imagine most people might uncover that information and find it really uh, interesting. But not everybody. In fact, maybe nobody but you would actually. <laughs> take it upon themselves to recreate that experience. So what was it for you that this like, you know, really inspired you to um, go the lengths that you did to bring well, it back? The, the Eureka moment was when I found the, the first floating bath file. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh my God, that's just what I'm going to do. And then I think I don't remember in 1981, I wrote an op-ed for, for the New York Times, which they printed. And they, pr they also showed, printed a picture a, from, by Jacob Reese 
of one of the floating baths with all of these people just having the best time there. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, you know, the waterfront is there. People who live in New York do not know that they live on islands. They don't know that the waterfront is accessible. Let's do it. Let's put a floating pool in, build a floating pool or get a floating pool and um, open up the waterfront. Mm. Um, you, you shared the story earlier, which I really like learning about the, you know, a child who asked you, why, why did you do this um, and for free? Um, do you have any other proud moments you'd like to share? Just stories of, you know, a after this was opened and achieved, um, getting to witness people enjoying the water and in an unusual way, right? It's not just a swimming pool, but a swimming pool on, you know, on a river in, in the water, as you're saying, yeah. on the waterfront. For, for, for me, it's, it's uh, swimming in water on water, mm. or swimming on in water in water, <laughs> just, or on water, yes. Uh, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, just other proud moments, you know. Oh. Of, well, of the day the pool opened in Brooklyn, um, it was a beautiful day. I had you know, I've seen the architecture is so gorgeous. And when it was brand new, it was unbelievably gorgeous. And I walked up and um, th there's a ramp you had to, from the land to the, to the barge. And I, I came through the, the, the entryway and I looked, there's a place that's, that's up high on a second level that you can look down at the pool. And I was virtually in tears. And then the next moment that I was so proud of was that um, the, who was it? The, I think it was Adrian Benepe uh, blew the whistle and a whole bunch of kids of all sizes and ages, including my seven-year-old granddaughter jumped in. And that was really, I was so proud of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, for those of us who haven't had the privilege of swimming in water on water, how would you describe that? Um, well, it's it, it. we had it anchored at Brooklyn Bridge Park. We had a whole bunch of anchors so that it didn't really rock too much, but the people who were working there had to kind of get used to it and get their, get their water legs. Um, back the woman who was, who was in charge the first year got seasick and she spent, had to take a, uh, seasick medicine the whole time she was running running the program. Um, and then now in uh, Barreto Point Park, they have a second barge that is nestled up next to it. So there is absolutely no motion because in the East River where it is, there are a lot of boats that are going back and forth and very close to the pool. And um, so there's a very pretty, night, wonderful picture of Mariana Koval, who was very, very instrumental in helping me get this done from the Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy, swimming in water on water. Mm. And it's really true. That's one of the experiences of being a city dweller is that um, without concerted effort to get to the water, unless you're somebody with the privilege of living on the, on the waterfront, you can forget that, you know, that there's, water all around us. You know, the Harbor School that's on Governor's Island, which is there to teach, I mean, it's, it's the whole thing is teaching uh, water skills and, and oyster, making oyster bays, etc. When they first opened, they were like five subway rides into Brooklyn. Dry land. <laughs> Right, I've, I've, I've wondered actually about having, having taken my own children to Governor's Island and passing by that, that school, which also seems like an unlikely dream, right? <laughs> Somebody exactly. I don't Absolutely. know the story behind it, but I'm sure that was also, took a lot of labor on, on many yep. people's part. Um, but I did have that thought, like what would it take to be a student here, like to get here actually, it's not far as the, as the crow flies, but it can be a challenge, right? Um, you have to get the, get the uh, ferry. But you know, the, the Coast Guard P families and Army families lived there for years and years and years and they got to work. Um, so t tell us a little bit more about you know, why you chose to write this book. It sounds like you had encouragement from somebody to tell the story. Who is your intended audience? Um, 
What do you hope people will take away from this story? Well, in my intended audience is, is architects because this is a kind of it, you know funky design here. Mm -hmm. My intended audience is our urban planners. Mm -hmm. My intended audience are people, you know, private individuals who want to try to get something done here in the city and that it can get done. It you know takes time, it takes from you know problems galore. But I when um, Michael McGandy came to me, he said, I'd like you to write a book about New York for us. And I said, well, I've got a, I've got a project and it's gonna be called No Good Deed Goes Unpunished. And that was my husband's title for it. And Michael said, no, you can't do that, but you can write the book. <laughs> I agree, it has the perfect title. <laughs> and I think it's a great <laughs> nickname for you as well as for the part <laughs> itself. Um, but I have to say, I just appreciated reading this as a New Yorker, like as a, somebody who works for the city, as somebody who delights in um, seeing her children swim. And it made me just think about how, this feels like a real New York look to me, you know, like that there's some things that are, um, that feel like, okay, this is a, this is an amazing and perhaps challenging dream, but this is a place I think where you can find like-minded people to support even um, fabu you know, a, a, a confabulation can manifest, right? Mm -hmm. And so I like this also as kind of just a story about, all right, you can pull off something big with teamwork and grit and, um, and what a gift it is to do something like that for others, you know, um, thinking about giving joy to others. Exactly. I, I really appreciated it along those lines. I just thank you to say. for that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have some questions coming in and some comments. Here's one from Lewis. Would the underserved not be better off if the pool were located in the lower income neighborhoods in the West Central Bronx or even in the Rockaways on Jamaica Bay? Isn't it, 20, it, yeah, go ahead. This is Loretta, a, a, this is a question Point, a couple parts. Mm -hmm. Beretta Point Park is a the lowest income neighborhood of the city. It has got the highest asthma rate and the highest obesity rate. Mm -hmm. And they are located just, just north of um, the Hunts Point. Yeah. Um, for, this is the same, the same uh, commenter. Uh, also remember that the barge pool in Barreto Park should be open again soon, but it is of course located in the East Bronx on the East River. Conversely, would not the money be better used if it were put into new public pools in underserved areas with free swimming instruction added for the communities? Would you care to respond to that? Um, there is free, free instruction. The Parks Department not only feeds the kids breakfast and lunch, but they also have swimming lessons in the morning and they also have a team that they have begun to put together. So I think, I think this is a very needy committee, uh, sorry, community where it is. Mm -hmm. And there are other pools in the, uh, you know, intermediate pools inland around the Bronx. Mm -hmm. um, this is from Leslie. George Washington High School in Washington Heights has two filled in pools. It would be so great to see them opened again. Schools should have pools so that all children learn to swim. Care to comment? I agree with that. That's, that's finance. That has to go in the city budget or the education budget. Yeah, I it's, agree it's, with it's you. It's like uh, New Yorkers or parks, it's, it's playgrounds. You know, there are a lot, there were in the past, and there are fewer of them now, there were playgrounds that were associated with, pool, with schools. As soon as the school day ended, those playgrounds were locked. Mm -hmm. And one of the things the New Yorkers Parks worked with uh, was to try to get those playgrounds opened, you know, off into the late afternoon in the evening. Yeah, piggybacking off of, um... Off of that that statement, which I agree with, not only as a resident of Washington Heights, but as somebody who under, you know deeply understands the importance of learning to swim as part of a you know a child's up, upbringing, for safety reasons as well as for pleasure, right? Um, what is a good way for for you know citizens to advocate for um, more pools, more lessons, uh, openings? <sighs> 
Um, well, um, one thing that I was going to do, the pool was going to close uh, several years ago because it, the permit from the state had, was up and um, was, was, was finished. And I said, if, and this was the governor was running for election at that time. And I said, if they decide they're gonna not put money, not they're gonna close the pool. It had nothing to be putting the city, the city was putting money into it. Uh, if it's, they're not gonna give them the permit to reopen, then I'm gonna take everybody who is here at the pool today up to Albany <laughs> to make noise. I mean, that's, that's one way to do it, but you know, you have to you know, write letters, send petitions, contact your local Congress person, your, your local state, state representative. Um, this is from Charles was a question, is or was there a floating pool in the Seine in Paris? Was yeah. it a potential model? Yes. In fact, I went to Paris and at that point they were beginning to put more of them in, the, they have in the, in the Seine. In fact, there are quite a lot of them now. They're cement and they actually sort of are attached to the shore and they, and they, they float, um, but they don't have the problem that, that, that we have, which is the casting of shadows. Mm. Um, because there's no law there that says you can't cast a shadow. I see. Um, this is from Nilka. And as I work on capping the Cross Bronx to reconnect communities, reduce noise and air pollution and create more park land, I'm totally inspired by your work. Thank you, I am so inspired. <laughs> well, thank you. And good luck to what you're doing. <laughs> um, and this is from Rick. The Vancouver Canada Park Board recently adopted a comprehensive aquatic strategy called Van Splash. It includes the prospect of future floating pools. However, we also have some water quality issues primarily in an inlet called False Creek, which needs to be resolved. Currently, the stormwater system can mix with wastewater, adversely affecting water quality. Do um, you have any comment or advice for Rick in this? Well, I do because I originally, one of the places that we were looking for when we first decided we're trying to bring it to New York, uh, Transistor Park, um, Trans Transmitter Park is in the, on the waterfront, on the East River waterfront in the Bronx, sorry, in, in um, Brooklyn. And um, I went to various board meetings at that uh, community board meetings at that time to try to convince people that, yes, you ought to have a floating pool here. Uh, and then they said, well, you know, why can't you just use river water? And I said, just take a look out of your window. And there are three sewer outfalls right there. Do you want yeah. to swim in that water? No. <laughs> Yeah, and so, so those that the sewer outfall thing has to really combine is called combined sewer outfall CSOs. That's just the, the little by little they're fixing that up, but it's it's not good. Mm. Um, here's from Margaret, who begins by thanking you for your project. What is Anne's swimming experience? Pool, open water? Uh, both. I learned to swim in in the South River in out, out south of Annapolis, Maryland. Um, I was on the swimming team at the Dalton School when I was in high school there, and I was on the swimming team at my college. Mm. So those were pools, but I've also uh, lived in Mamaroneck where, where we were right on the river and swam there. Mm. Uh, I've been in the ocean. Don't like the ocean as much. It's scary for me now, but. Mm -hmm. um, this is from Julia. Thank you. I would love for one day to be able to swim in the Hudson. Do you think this will ever be possible in an everyday way that is accessible to all New Yorkers? Cities like Copenhagen and Zurich have cleaned their waterways for swimming. They are each very different than New York, of course. Yes, and as in fact, you can swim in the Hudson now. So the East River, you can't, but the Hudson has been really, really cleaned up. And there are places along the, along the Hudson as you go further north where there are actually beaches and you can get in the water and swim. Uh, part of the pro Hudson problem is the, are the currents 
and you, you, you probably you need some kind of a fencing or an enclosure so that you can use the water, but you don't get swept away as the tides go in and out. Got it. Um, an anonymous attendee also wants to mention the wonderful floating pool in the Danube Canal in the middle of Vienna. Um, they're, they're all over the place. There mm -hmm. are uh, like three of them on the uh, in um, one of the lakes in Italy, the Lago Como, Lake Como. There, uh, Switzerland has a whole bunch of them. Hmm. Here's a kind of funny question from Charles, a little bit irreverent. Did you ever consider following the leadership strategy of not asking permission, but just do it and ask forgiveness? Could I did. <laughs> I did. I did. I brought the pool to New York from, I did not have permission. I brought the pool to New York that I needed the state permission and I brought it to New York and um, was, you know, fined. <laughs> you, you had your hand slapped with a fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, Leslie shares that she lived on a houseboat at 79th Street for almost 40 years and swam in the river each summer. The 79th Street boat, boat, basin, boat basin on the Hudson. And she also wonders if I can ask um, if you've talked to any of the mayoral candidates about bringing more floating pools. Um, I haven't because the problem again is getting the state to give a permit for such a thing. Got it's it. It, yeah, the, you know we, we actually worked with with uh, Mayor Bloomberg to get a second and we have a design for Jonathan Kirschenfeld has a design for a second pool and we'd love to bring one back to Brooklyn or wherever but the permitting is a real problem hmm. um, here's a question from Audrey that kind of connects to or extends from the question about floating in the headset um, first Audrey wants to congratulate you on the on the book um, yes, and then thank you, Audrey what do you see as the future of pools and swimming in the city? Is it more floating pools on barges, improving water quality and establishing beaches or some combination of both? Well, I would say it's improving water quality first. Um, more floating pools, well, plus pool, I'm sure many of you who are listening have heard of plus pool, which is a filtered pool where actually it's just a membrane. You won't get all of the uh, DEC problems with that. The water comes from the river through the membrane into this pool area and at the end of the day it goes through the membrane cleaned and back into the river. So theoretically it's also cleaning the river and uh, plus pool has got some beginning to have uh, some uh, pre-projects. They'll be in the East River near the Manhattan Bridge this summer. So look out for those. We will. Here's Nancy Webster from Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy. And it was an honor to work with you and host the Floating Pool Lady in 2007. Truly a magical summer. Congratulations on the book and thank you for the many ways you've made New York City a better, greener city. Thank you, Nancy. And you too are making New York a better place. <laughs> Um, here's Ryan. As a public pool user, I wanted to know if you had any opinions about the city's policy to serve breakfast and lunches in New York City pool locations. Are they compatible? One summer in Red Hook, the pool was closed about three times a week because of contamination, kids throwing up, etc. Oh dear. <laughs> um, you know that that's that's I think a problem with the Department of Education, which actually provides the food. Uh, one thing that I do remember is going to the pool in Brooklyn and uh, there was a uh, rabbi standing watching the, the kids in the pool. And I looked and I said, what's for lunch? And they said, ham. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of same kind of a story there. Yeah. I have to say, having, you know, I mentioned I used to bring my boys to Highbridge and I hope to again. And um, we really appreciated the free lunches they had on Sundays. We would have, it was often like, you know, bologna and cheese sandwiches. And it was just, it's such a delight that anybody who was there could and was hungry could receive lunch. It felt like one, you know, one of those gifts of the city that just felt really special. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, here's a note from Lewis. There are various swimming clubs and also triathlons that use both the Hudson River and the East River today. You can swim in the rivers provided you do not go into the water for two days after a rain. 
to allow the waters to clean out. I kayak and swim during the season regularly. Um, yeah, that's happening more and more. Yeah, I've enjoyed um, in the Inwood uh, Kayak Club does a free you know, kayak lessons for um, interested families or New York citizens. Mm -hmm. and what a beautiful experience. You know, as you were describing, being on the water as a New Yorker, just and also getting to see the city from the vantage point of the water, the, something quiet and, and still, even as you're moving, where you're, you're part of the city, but distant from it, that allows you a different perspective. I, I had such pleasure with my kids kayaking, um, you know, from, from Inwood to, on, the, on the Hudson down to uh, the George Washington Bridge and back. This is a short stretch of the river and having to fight currents, as you mentioned the currents, like that's, that's real. But, um, but just the peacefulness of experiencing the city in that way was very foreign to me and felt again, like one of these wonderful points of access is a treat to see, gosh, I never looked at the city like this before and so close to where I live, right? Yeah. yeah. Is that a park launch, park department launch place or is it? Uh, I, I don't know, I, that's a good question. I, maybe somebody in the audience is, I'm not sure if it's private or, or public, but it's. A, I, I just love that they do that for interested people between uh, Memorial Day and Labor Day on the weekends, you can. It's you incredible can. to be out in the water and then look back at the city. It's just, and particularly in a kayak when you're sort of in the water. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's from, from Ryan, considering the, the way you connected public pools with necessary access to recreation for youth. Can you speak a bit to what corollary opportunities can present themselves during the colder months? Well, you can design a floating pool that is closed in the winter that actually can become a skating rink in the winter time. We didn't do it. We needed to have just bare nuts and bolts because we just wanted to get it done. But there's a lot of ways to, to do this. Good. Um, uh, somebody, EAB says, I see that pools got approval for a floating pool in the East River. That's plus pool. Plus pool, yes, yes. But, but this is just sort of a, 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 a test launch. They're just sort of beginning to see how things work. Okay. Um, and the same commenter mentions East River crew takes out people in rowboats at no cost check their website. Mm -hmm. It's nice to have people sharing resources about how to enjoy the water, which is, it continues to be difficult to access. Yeah. So you have these little tips or clues about where to, where to enter, how to get to it. Um, so thank you for these comments. Um, mm -hmm. Leslie said, yeah, there's nothing like kayaking and swimming on the Hudson. So much beauty and bliss. Um, and, and tells us, yes, that what I just mentioned, the resource I mentioned is Inwood Canoe and Kayak is the name of that organization. Mm -hmm. um, Leonard shares, my son tells me that he experiences no strong current issues when he swims in the Hudson up by the George Washington Bridge. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, Anne, as other questions are coming in from the audience, you, you've, you've talked about some other floating pools uh, in different cities. But I wonder, in addition to you know, the history that you read and perhaps other global examples of this, if there are, uh, you know, examples of magnificent um, urban planning, architecture, just sort of uh, dreams that that you saw that inspired you to pursue the creation of, of the floating pool lady. No, I have to admit, no. <laughs> People sent me uh, postcards of um, these incredible. I think they were in California. They were they were in ground pools and just really gorgeous things but no it was it was the floating bass that, that I was following mm -hmm. and it was Jonathan's architecture that made this special yeah um well, what a treat like for for an architect to have the opportunity to do something like this too right he was very tired <laughs> <laughs> he was stuck at the last minute he had to get a, a, a permit from the um, health department and they came down the day before it opened in Brooklyn and everything wasn't quite ready and Jonathan promised them that he would have it all done and he again being with somebody that you could get a friendship with and who would believe you and who would trust you they said okay go ahead open it 
Yeah, that's it. You know, I thought a lot because I was reading this book too. Of um, I, I live uh, on a on a block where there is a consistent ponding issue when there's heavy rain, um, having to do with some some structural issues. But our block association has had to deal with several agencies, all of whom it seems kind of passed passed the buck. DEP is this DOT. Um, is, it, is it actually D DOH because there's you know like mosquitoes breeding in the summer and it gets to be a, a freezing a freeze issue in the winter um, so it just a lot of a lot of agencies need to come in and they don't often work together so compatibly but yet when you find the one person who is really willing to listen to the story and cares and knows the other person in the agency to connect to it, it is possible but I really did like that line at the uh, the at the end, beginning of your book, the end of your prologue, saying, you know, the advice is <laughs> fight like hell because it, it does take that, you know, to actually pull something off in the city sometimes, and not even out of any institutional malice, but just because, yeah. you know, like a lot of these agencies are are underfunded and overwhelmed, right? Mm -hmm. um, which well, is and they have a job. I mean, for yeah. example, the the getting the permits uh, to go to. Uh, from the state in, in order to different permits in order to to be at uh, Brooklyn to, uh, to open in Brooklyn Bridge Park uh, or to arrive in Brooklyn Bridge Park there were people in the permits office in the insurance office the insurance was the big issue there and they had they were at had an office just near the near the uh, Hudson East River then they had a uh, they had to then approve it in their office and then they had to go up to the state and get approval from that. And that could take weeks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was a crazy project. They had no idea what it was and, you know, what kind of uh, insurance everybody was gonna have to have. Yeah. Just, and so, you know, it, it, that was their job and they weren't told to, that it was gonna be different. But they were told, look, let's get it done. So these guys did work very hard and they did get it done. Yeah, um, we have time for a few more questions from the audience before we need to close today. Uh, oh, here's actually an answer to a question you asked me, Anne, that I didn't know about regarding Inwood Canoe and Kayak. Um, Lewis tells us it's private, but they open periodically to the public. And then furthermore, shares a link. I hope that the audience can see this. Um, there are more than 20 different kayak rowing, sailing, dragon boats groups that offer free participation. Here's a website that lists most, not all of them. What a great resource to share with us, thank you. Um, and here from an anonymous attendee, uh, Anne, what is your opinion of shipping container pools for in-locked urban areas in New York City? Sorry, we repeat the question. What is- Do you have an opinion on um, shipping container pools for in-locked urban areas in New York City? Do you have any knowledge of- um, yeah, Yes, uh, the, during the Lindsay administration, they had actually they were like these large garbage containers um and they put them on a, on sort of these trucks and they carried them throughout the communities filled them with water every day emptied them out every night and that's all in the book yes yeah ryan wants to know what's next for you or the movement generally in opening up new york city shorelines and riversides to the public well as um it was said um, in the book that you mentioned when you started, um, I'm going to tend my garden for now. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, this is from Ellen Chesler. Congratulations, Anne. You are one of New York's genuine treasures. Can you comment briefly on your many years of service on the Parks Council, now New Yorkers for Parks, and what I know is your respect for advocacy organizations that work to improve public parks and other services. Thank you, Ellen. Um, well, I founded New Yorkers for Parks. At that point, it was called the Council for Parks and Playgrounds. I had uh, put worked with another friend to raise money to put safety surfacing under the swings and the slides in two, two Central Park playgrounds. And uh, Jerry Wilson, who was then the state senator, came to me and said, I think we need to have an organization to do something about the parks and sort of get everybody together in all the different boroughs. And he was joined by, of all people, Henry Stern. So I joined that group and we founded Council for Parks and Playgrounds, which then became 
the Parks Council and which then became New Yorkers for Parks. So yes, I was involved with it for a very long time. <laughs> Um, and this is a fact shared by Lewis. A little more info, pre-COVID-19, about four years ago, I did a number survey of total participation in the New York, New Jersey waterways. During one season, we estimated over 150,000 bodies. I wrote bodies because of course, many people got into the water more than once. Also the number did not include sailors, swimmers. Um, so and that leads me to a question I have for you as we, as we move toward closing. Uh, where do you plan to swim this summer, Anne? Well, um, I'm not in the city this summer. We do, we do not have a, a home in the city. So I'm going to swim here outside of my house. Um, but um, I'm actually, the pool is opening on the 26th of June. And the following week, I will go out and visit everybody there. Bring them copies of the book. I hope that I and my boys will be swimming at High Ridge Pool once the school year uh, closes. And I want to just thank you for your book because one of the many things that it, it had taught me is not to take for granted the um, opportunity, privilege, and joy of what it means to be able to get in the water, um, to, to, to watch my boys really just appreciating and, and the freedom and bliss of, of swimming. Um, thank you so much for all you've done to bring that feeling um, to so many New Yorkers, particularly youth, underserved youth. We had 30,000 people at the pool the, the summer before COVID. Wow. Yeah. And it was open from uh, the end of June until Labor Day. And the summer that it opened, and it was only for, I think, six weeks at Brooklyn, Bridge Park, we had 60,000 people, but it was, you know, a bigger community there. Yeah, it'll It'd be, be interesting. easier to reach. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what the numbers will be this year with the challenges at hand, but I feel now more than ever, you know, people, kids in particular need, having been through lockdown, quarantine, et cetera, lots of disruption, need that experience. So Definitely. thank you again. <laughs> The audience thanks you. And what a treat you all have um, in the opportunity to read this book. I have to say, I don't think it's just for urban planners and architects, but really, mm -hmm. or New Yorkers really, but for anybody who you know, could use some inspiration and what it takes, the grit that it takes to pull off a dream, um, particularly to give a dream to the underserved out of a feeling of, of, of love. So thanks for what you've done, Anne. One other thing is have a passion and follow your passion. That's a great note to end on. All right, everybody, thank you for coming today. Thank you again, Anne. Thank you.